this series is organized by the Jewish Art Salon with two co-sponsors. My name is Jona Verwe. I'm the co-founder and director of the Jewish Art Salon. It's the world's largest Jewish visual art organization. It's established in 2008 and based in New York City. We are a global network of contemporary artists, curators, art historians, and art writers. We have organized over 60 exhibitions, art events, and collaborations in the US, Europe, and Israel. We provide important programs and resources and develop lasting partnerships with the international art community and the general public. I'd like now to introduce our two co-sponsoring uh, organizations. Let me see if Art Kibbutz is here. I don't see Art Kibbutz. Oh, yes, Art Kibbutz. Esther is here. Hold on. Esther, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Um, thank you so much, Yona, for hosting and for this uh, encouraging words in these hard times. Uh, my heart is also um, with um, the African-American um, Jews and non-Jews as well. And uh, I hope that when uh, the times are easier, we'll be able to do some art projects uh, supporting them in uh, <clears throat> other ways as well, um, like we have done in the past. Um, I'm the founder of uh, Art Kibbutz, International Jewish Artists Residency Program. We've been in operation since 2011. Uh, we have done um, several artist residency programs and public art projects. We brought Jewish art to um, a lot of uh, festivals and um, we're always interested in um, showing that Jews have something interesting and relevant to say in the mainstream art conversation about interesting and important topics. And we regularly partner with Jewish Art Salon and it's, uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege uh, to have this time with you um, to learn about your work. And I'm very excited about today. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. And we so treasure, you know, the collaborations we've done with you in the past. So thank you very much for fulfilling a very important void. Jewish residencies are not like a very common thing. So um, we're all thrilled you're here and making it happen. Um, okay, so the other, art organization is Jada Arts. Um, Dana, would you like to say a few words? Yes, hi, thank you, Yona, and thank you everyone for being here today. I'm excited to be here. I'm the co-founder with, uh, many of you may know, Jonata Shimon. Um, Jada is a grassroots arts organization founded recently in 2019. Uh, we work toward the goal of cultivating the meta modern and we do so via collaborations like this one we have here today with the Jewish Art Salon. We're very grateful to be a part of. Uh, we also host collective art exhibits and artists and residence programs. Um, thank you guys for having me on today. Thank you so very much, Dana. And um, we will now move on with our first presenter alan falk from new haven connecticut has exhibited extensively in europe the uk and the us and he has been represented by major commercial galleries in new york and london uh, in both solo and group exhibitions his work hangs in museums universities corporate and private collections worldwide and he's a fellow of the jewish art salon and his website alanfalk.com all right, Alan, take it away. Okay, thank you, Yona. Um, I'm so glad that you are well, and I thank everybody for joining us uh, today. Um, <clears throat> so I'm here today because I have an exhibition of watercolors and paintings, which opened in February at the CBSRZ Synagogue in Chester, Connecticut. Um, the show was supposed to run through the end of April of this year. However, the synagogue is closed. The show is frozen and uh, is euphemistically, uh, it's been left hanging. Uh, the focus of this exhibition entitled Between Two Worlds is an exp exploration of the romantic and magical aspects of love and the search for the sublime. The exhibition comprises of a series of 23 watercolors based on the Song of Songs and four paintings based on Sholomansky's celebrated Yiddish, Yiddish drama, The Dybbuk. When I learned about the jazz virtual presentations, I thought it would be a nice idea to propose inviting you all to a virtual tour of the show, especially considering that even if the show was actually open, it's on display in the far reaches of Northeast Connecticut. 
Now, having had my proposal accepted, I thought how best to present the work. I concluded that if I was to talk about each of the individual 27 paintings, we'd be here till, ne till next Sunday. So I decided instead to focus on the background and history of making the two series, what I learned while researching them, and how I determined the connection between the two while I show you all the artworks in sequence. As there are only four pieces in the Dybbuk series, I will uh, explain them in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to go to my presentation and just bear with me while I share this. So this is actually the third time that, uh, that these two series of works have been shown together uh, as an interconnected group. They were previously exhibited in 2013 at the Jewish Religious Center in Williams College, uh, Mass, uh, when I was a scholar in residence, and at the Charter Oak Cultural Center in Hartford, Connecticut in the spring of last year. I've also shown the Song of Songs separately including a previous show at CBSRZ, uh, which was a two-person exhibition with my fellow art salon colleague, Leah Caroline. Uh, in these ex contrasting narratives, one is physical, earthbound, and rich in the abundance of life, while the other is spiritual, soulful, and weighed down by tragedy and death. Both are in some way about lost and found love, and in both, unconditional love prevails over all challenges. The intention of these works is to direct the viewer towards the unity attained by the lovers as they transcend their duality through acts of love. For many years, I wanted to paint a series of works that dealt with the subject of love and intimacy and concluded that the Song of Songs would be my vehicle of choice. However, after reading some traditional translations, I found difficulty with them as they seem to be overly influenced by theological agendas although clearly the underlying theme in all of them is unconditional love. I continued to search for translation that was closer to my own feelings about the sensual nature of the poem. My past work is focused on a wide range of human expression from rage and jealousy to tenderness and love. Recently, my focus has shifted to the expression of the spiritual and magical, an outgrowth of my experience from working on the songs in Dybbuk series. Started the songs watercolors in 2011, and that led me to think about the Dybbuk, more about that later. I completed work on the songs in the fall of 2014. The Dybbuk series was painted uh, during 2013. A uh, quick note, the, uh, the text callouts on the right side of the screen are not part of the actual paintings. They are verses from the poem that relate to each of the individual works. The background on the Song of Songs, also known as the Song of Solomon, the songs belongs to the third section of the Tanakh, the Ketuvim, or writings, included with Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. They make up the Megillot, the five scrolls that are read on various religious festivals of the Jewish year, the songs being read on Passover. And here I have to point out that like the Esther story, there's no direct mention of God in the Song of Songs. But unlike the Esther story, the songs is written in the first person, primarily through a female voice the only place in the entire Tanakh where this occurs. Over the centuries, there have been many interpretations of the Song of Songs, primarily allegorical. The first known interpretation was by Rabbi Akiva in the first century of the Common Era. Akiva regarded the songs as an allegory in the form of a dialogue between God's love for the Israelites, with whom was shared a sacred covenant. In Akiva's dialogue, all the imagery is related in some way to the events of the Exodus one of the reasons for it being read on Passover. Since then, many Jewish dialogues have appeared, offering a variety of interpretations and commentaries. And here I'm going to borrow from Rabbi Jeffrey De Dennis, who teaches rabbinic literature at the University of North Texas, and is the author of the Encyclopedia of Jewish Myth, Magic, and Mysticism. To quote and paraphrase Rabbi Dennis, once you claim to hold the key to unlock the secret treasure of the Song of Songs, i.e. it's about God and Israel, or it's about God and the soul, etc. Then you have to explain the parabolic meaning of all the figures, symbols, or imagery. What do the garden, apricots, or breasts refer to? 
since Akiva's dialogue, there's been a plethora of Jewish interpretive divisions. Here are a few of the major interpretations. In a dialogue between God and the soul, a Neoplatonic perspective is the primary focus of this 13th century commentary by Isaac Ibn Sahula. Also in the 13th century, there's a dialogue between the feminine and masculine aspects of divinity. This reading derives from a circle of Kabbalists centered in Garona, Spain, headed by Rabbi Ezra ben Solomon. This interpretation is included in the Zohar. A dialogue between the material and the intellect is a scholastic interpretation written in the 14th century by French Jewish philosopher Levi van Gershon, also known as Gersonides. And finally, a dialogue between the Torah and its disciples is to be found in the 16th century writings of Rabbi Shlomo Halevi Alkabetz, perhaps best known for having written the words to Lecha Dodi. As I mentioned in my introduction, after reading some inter interpretations, I ended up feeling somewhat unsatisfied. They didn't make any sense to me. I felt that the true meaning was hidden. I'd come to the conclusion that the songs might just be a universal narrative in poetic form about the awakening and consummation of love between a young woman, a Shulamite, from Hebrew Shulamit, a woman of Jerusalem, and her lover, a shepherd, who meets secretly in an idyllic landscape where they discover and express the pleasures of love. Here their mutual adoration is declared and their intimate relationship is described through rich metaphor that alludes to a harmonious relationship between the human body and nature. At length, I found the translation of Ariel Block and Hannah Block, published in 1995. It was a breath of fresh air that affirmed my understanding of the text. Ariel Block was Professor Emeritus in Near Eastern Studies at Berkeley, and Hannah Block, his wife, was a poet and professor of English at Mills College, California. Their poetic translation is lyrical and voluptuous and has been hailed by Jewish academics for its precise and assiduous scholarship. It brings the pure linguistic meaning of the poem to light and illuminates the, the subtleties and nuances of the Aramaic Hebrew text. The lovers meet in an idealized landscape of fertility and abundance, a kind of Eden where they discover the pleasures of love. The passage from innocence to experience is a subject of the Eden story too, but there the loss of innocence is fraught with consequences. The songs looks at the same border crossing and sees only the joy of discovery. As I mentioned earlier in the songs, it is the young woman who is the predominant voice. There is no male dominance, no female subordination, and no stereotyping. She works and is independent, fully the equal of the man. Although at times he approaches her, more often she initiates their meetings. Her movements are bold and open as she seeks out her soulmate. No secrecy hides her yearnings. Moreover, she dares to describe love with revealing metaphors. Nor is this woman called a wife, nor is she required to bear children. In fact, to the issues of marriage and procreation, the songs does not speak. Love for the sake of love is its message, and the portrayal of the female delineates this message best. In the songs, love is fulfilled when the woman and the man close the circle of intimacy to all but themselves. The poem's narrative of the romantic and magical aspects of love adds to the panorama of emotional and familial relationships that are explored in the Torah and later reading, later writings. So was Solomon the author? For centuries, the Song of Songs has been attributed to Solomon, but recent biblical scholarship has opened the door to further understanding and interpretation. The blocks tell us that it was common practice in antiquity to attribute, attribute works of literature to eminent figures from the past, for example, the Psalms of attribution to David. This way, the Song of Songs came to be associated with Solomon, known for also being a poet as well as he was a sage. The image of wealth and luxury are associated with Solomon, but according to the block research, the young shepherd is not the king, but rather likened to the king, by the Shulamite. Metaphorically speaking, he is her King Solomon. So when was the songs written and how did it manage to get included into the Ketuvim? 
The blocks state that the most reliable criteria for dating the songs is the language, in particular the amount of Aramaic content. A Syrian dialect used as a lingua franca in the Near East from the 6th century BC. This criteria provides an imperfect but useful linguistic carbon dating <coughs> that links the songs to a period well after the reign of Solomon. The songs also includes grammatical construction and syntax of Persian and Greek influence, suggesting that the songs were written down most likely in the Hellenistic period. The earliest example of love poetry is some 4,000 years old from the ancient Near East and is known as the, song so the love song of Shu Sen. The poem originates from Sula in southern Mesopotamia and is believed to have been recited by a bride of Sumerian King Shu Sin, who ruled between 2037 and 2029 BCE. For millennia, love poems in the Middle East were recited, sung, or performed by traveling poets and musicians at marriage ceremonies. This form is still in use today at weddings in Syria, Iran, and other Middle Eastern countries. In the songs, the name of God is never uttered. There is no reference to Israel's history or to the national themes that figure so importantly in the rest of the biblical narratives. The erotic joy of the two lovers, the human body presented as an object of admiration, the beauty of nature appreciated for its own sake, all seem out of place in the Bible. The Song of Songs was granted canonical status centuries after the Torah and the prophets. The blocks speculate that the songs may have been preserved because they were numbered among the literary treasures of the Jewish people and it may be that the attribution to Solomon in the title was a factor for admission. The poem appears to be a reenactment of the first half of the Garden of Eden, uh, as it alludes to an earthly paradise. However, as the Eden narrative led humanity towards the expulsion and inevitable dualism, the songs closes the circle by pointing us back towards uni unity and the shedding of that duality through acts of unconditional love that's when the Shulamite declares her oneness with her lover, my beloved is mine and I am his. This idea of perfect union symbolizes the desire to become one and find wholeness, further expressed by the poem's references to the natural world by blurring the lines between the lovers and their environment as they compare each other to the mountains, plants and animals that populate their land. For me, the poem is a confirmation of how unconditional love can be a holistic path to healing our world and are imperative to be the guardians of the earth. A little about my approach to the paintings. As I explored the various themes and motives of, the trans of this translation, I also became aware of underlying timeless themes of social concerns. For example, the Shulamite's brothers are embarrassed by her uninhabited expressions of love. And later in the poem, when she seeks her lover, she is inexplicably beaten by a watchman. I employed specific motifs and colors to portray the two central characters. I painted the shepherd's complexion yellow-orange, symbolizing the poem's metaphors of comparing him to the apricot, which, was, which has connotations of male eroticism. The Shulamite skin is painted violet-purple, identifying her with vineyards and pomegranates to which she is often compared, evoking her beauty and sensuality. This difference in coloration also alludes to a possible distinction in the race of the lovers. Early in the poem, the Shulamite declares, I am dark, daughters of Jerusalem, dark as the tents of Kedar. Dark skin has often defined a person's social standing as much as it is still an unfortunate factor in our own time. What do we know about Kedar? Kedar was the second son of Ishmael. Kedar's descendants became nomadic tribes and their tents were covered in black sheepskins. Kedar also means to blacken, and so the connection is multiple. But through their abounding adoration, the lovers in the Song of Songs defy potential prejudice and hazards through their love for each other. The connection between the songs and the Dibbuk. While working on the songs, I had a feeling that there was some connection between the poem and Anski's drama, The Dibbuk, also subtitled Between Two Worlds in which predestined lovers, not unlike the lovers in the songs, face enormous obstacles. The Dybbuk is part, partly based on Jewish folk tales and superstitions drawn from Ansky's travels through the Pale of Russia. On the surface, these two great works of 
Jewish literature appear to be at opposite ends of an emotional ladder, while the Song of Songs teems with images of life, nature, and carnal desire exuding joy and light. The Dibbuk deals with our darker fears, death and afterlife, folk tales and superstition. Yet the central theme of both works is predetermined and unconditional love that prevails. In the song, the Shulamite proclaims, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. In the Dibbuk, Leia, the principal female character, declares predestined, predestined bridegroom, I am united to you forever. Both cases we can read that as, you are my soulmate, or in Yiddish, you are my beshert, my destiny. I had never read the Dibbuk, but in my childhood, I recall seeing a Yiddish film version of it at a local movie theater. After some research, I discovered the film on YouTube. It was the 1937 Polish film directed by Michael Wazinski. However, this version had Polish subtitles, but I watched it anyway. In an early scene, the principal male character, Hanan, speaks of Zalman, Solomon. I bought a, I bought a print copy of the play and in Act One, the song's reference is made. Hanan asks, which sin is the strongest of all? Which one is the hardest to conquer? The sin of lust for a woman, isn't it? And when you have cleansed this sin in a powerful flame, when this greatest uncleanness becomes the greatest holiness, it becomes the Song of Songs. He then sings a verse from the Songs. Clearly, Ansky was profoundly influenced by the Song of Songs. Like the lovers in the songs, Leah and Hanan come to symbolize the Jewish concept of unity, of making two into one, of completing a circle and making it whole. The Dibbuk tells a story of two ill-fated lovers, Hanan, son of Nisan, and Leah, the daughter of Sender. While students at a yeshiva, Sender and Nisan make a solemn vow betrothing their unborn children. Life separates the friends, and in the interim, Nisan dies. The children grow up unaware of the betrothal, but the power of the vow leads them to meet each other. Hannah, the penniless yeshiva scholar and brilliant student of Jewish mysticism, finds his way to Leah's village. Leah's father, Sander, is now prosperous and has forgotten the vow he made. He has negotiated a marriage between Leah and the son of an equally wealthy man named Nachman. In my paintings, I try to capture the pivotal moments in the play those that best express my feelings about the emotional high points of the drama, the sadness and constraint, the tragedy, the possession, and the final redemption. <laughs> Leah and Hanan. Here I introduce the characters in the synagogue scene from Act One of the play, in which Hanan, hiding amongst the shadows, is described as gaunt and wild-eyed from sleepless hours delving into Jewish mysticism, along with his burning passion for Leah. In the play, his gaze is described as fixated on Leia, while for her part, Leia suppresses her feelings, keeping her eyes lowered so as not to make any eye contact. Through the window is the Holy Grave, the subject of the next painting. The Holy Grave. In the scene from Act Two, Leia visits the grave of a couple who were murdered on their wedding day at the hands of the infamous 17th century Cossack Bodan Khmelnytsky referred to in the play by Ansky as Hamaluk. The couple had been buried side by side in the wedding clothes they were wearing when killed, in accordance with the Jewish custom for burying martyrs, known as al Kedush Hashem, meaning sanctification of God's name. We are told in the play how it has become a time-honored custom for people leaving the synagogue after a wedding to go and dance at the grave to cheer the dead bride and groom where they lie. The gravestone bears the inscription here lie a pure and holy bridegroom and bride, murdered to the glory of God in the year 5408. Peace be with them. 5408 corresponds, corresponds to the Gregorian calendar the year 1647. Reaching out her arms to the dead couple, Leia speaks of having known them, of having seen them in her dreams and when awake. The end of the act two is a moment of possession. The Dibbuk. Hanan has died from grief at the thought of losing Leia to another, and his dislocated spirit, a dibbuk, enters Leia's body, an action that signals their path to oneness. Leia has refused her intended bridegroom, and, a se and in a seemingly dispossessed man's voice, which is that of Hanan, she shrieks at her would-be future father-in-law, Nachman, the name Hamaluk, 
trembling Nachman declares she has gone mad. In the final act of the play, a rabbinical court is called to exercise the dibbuk from Leah. After an intense struggle with the rebellious soul, the rabbis finally succeed. Excuse me. Something's, ah, I'm sorry. That's the dibbuk. <laughs> That's the resurrection. Resurrection. In the final act of the play, a rabbinical court is called to exercise a dibbuk from Leah. After an intense struggle with the rebellious soul, the rabbis finally succeed. The groom arrives as the rabbis prepare to proceed with the arranged marriage ceremony. But Leah hears Hanan's voice and opens her heart to him, pleading for him to return. Hanan responds, I have left your body. I will come to your soul. He appears and Leah and the audience see him. She approaches Hanan, and according to the stage direction, at the spot where he has appeared, their two forms merge into one. It is from the last lines of the play that were the inspiration for this painting. Leia speaks, a great light flows about me, predestined bridegroom. I am united with you forever. We soar upward together, higher and higher, higher and higher. Love for the sake of love is the overwhelming message in both of these literary works. I mentioned earlier in the songs, love is fulfilled when the woman and the man close a circle of intimacy to all but themselves. And in the Dibbert, the lovers also close a circle to all but themselves through the unwarranted tragedy of death. And at that point, I will return to the living. And um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Okay, thank you so much, Alan. Um, okay, so uh, from now on, we're going to do a different format for asking questions. Um, if you all look at your window, at the bottom is a participants box. So click on that. And then on the sideline somewhere, there should be a... Okay, hold on a second. There should be a raise hands. I'm so sorry. I did this earlier in a trial thing and now I don't see it. Okay. It is in the bottom called more. So you're in the participants box. You see a list of the participants. And at the bottom, there is a button called more. Click on that. And you know what? That is not a raise hand thing either. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Hold on a second. Yeah, hand on. Go back to the last screen and it's on the left, not on the more line. I'm sorry, say it again. Go back to the last screen, go to participants and instead of going to the side where it says. Okay, you're, you're falling away, Helene, except say it again. Go to participants. I'm here. And then on the bottom where you said to go to more. Yeah. Go to the left side and it says raise your hand. You see that? No, but you know what? It's probably because I'm the host now and I cannot do it. But can everybody else see this button? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. I can All see right. It. Great. So I no, now, do you see it? Do you see a hand um in the let's say my box right now? Okay, yes, hold on, hold on. Um, that way you'll know that people are using it. Uh, I do see hands in several. Yes, I do. Okay, so Thank that's you. how you can now monitor for it. Fantastic. Okay, okay. so just so you all know, we're going to start with uh, people who haven't really spoken up yet so far. Um, starting with Shoshana Brombacher. Yes, I have a question. Uh, first of all, I found it an extremely interesting. Question. I loved it. And Okay, oh, hold on, hold on. Everybody else, please mute yourself until um, I call on you because otherwise it, the screen is going to hop back and forth to everybody who has like dogs in the background or any other noises. So everybody, please mute yourself except for Shoshana. Okay, um, I have a question. You presented the Shira Shirim with very modern people, like modern dresses, and the watchmen look like uh, the soldiers you find in the uh, old city in Jerusalem. The Dibuk 
was more like contemporary with the, the time of the book. Is there a reason for that? I'm sorry, could, could somebody just clarify what she asked? I, it's, it's a little unclear. Yeah, yeah but what I mean is uh, Shira Shirim looks like very modern. The, the people have like modern clothes, a t-shirt, a modern dress. But in the D book, they do not. I loved it, by the way. I just am curious. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I, can somebody suddenly clarify what, what that question was? I think what she's saying, uh, Alan, is that in, your, in the one series that you did, the people are dressed like very contemporary, while in the other, they are not. And she was just curious if there was a reason for that. Oh, um, <clears throat> actually, generally, I try to uh, dress people in, um, in, in clothes that are sort of uh, don't really relate to any, any era, um, which is, you know, what I try to do in the Song of Songs. Um, in Dibbuk, yeah, I think they're more, they're more in the, 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 male, the male, especially Hannon, um, because he's a, he's a, he was a yeshiva bocha. Um, that, clo that clothing hasn't changed for centuries. So I sort of um, implied uh, may maybe a, a, um, a sort of a, a nod there to um, the orthodox way of dressing. Um, but Is most, this of, most of my work, I usually deliberately try to make a sort of universal clothing. That don't really relate to any particular era. Yeah. Well, One more quick question: the whole series of the Dibble, can we see it somewhere online? I'm sorry, Yona, could you clarify that question? Uh, the the series of the Dibble, I myself have been busy with the Dibble, so I'm very interested to see your series as well. Can we see it online somewhere? All the paintings of the Dibble. Yona. She's asking if we can see the series of the Dibbuk online somewhere. Maybe you can put it in the chat room, Alan, after the uh, questions yeah. are over. Maybe you can just type the link, the direct link to the Dibbuk in the chat room. Yes. Not, not now, afterwards. Okay. All right, moving on to the next caller, Margot. Margot, are you there? Okay, maybe she changed her mind. Oh. Hi, Margo. Hi, Alan. I just wanted to tell you I enjoyed it very oh, much. Oh, boy, that's really quiet. I had given you a thumbs up. It wasn't a question. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I just realized that you gave a thumbs up. I'm sorry. It looks so similar to, to the other ones, which are also blue. Okay. Next question by Cheslin Amato, please. Well, it's not a question either. I just really wanted to celebrate um, the, the, the beauty of your presentation. I mean, I think it, in, in the sense of the, the layeredness always of our tradition that between the images, the, the text to read, what you said and how you said it, it just became, you know, an, an active verb of the Song of Songs, you know, as uh, happening. So uh, thank you very, very much for that. Thank you so much. And, and my comment is, uh, Cheslin, I love that you and several others today on the call have put images of your own work behind you. It's like, it's a lovely way to, to get to know your work as well, like that. Mm. Okay, so right now in this particular uh, section, we only have time for one more question, but we can ask more questions later on after uh, the second presenter has finished. So we, who else? Nancy Current, please ask your question. Okay, I'm on now, right? You can hear me? Yep. Um, Alan, I remember that you uh, you mentioned in your series about the Shir Hasharim that there was nothing about, uh, it was purely about love, nothing about being married or any of society's norms in it. But yet you showed the picture of uh, the man's mother putting the crown on his head for his wedding crown. It says, on his wedding day in the translation that you provided. So I'm, and I remember when I read your book and got to that point, I thought, oh, uh, here we've evolved down this long path of, of um, sanctifying love and only on its own terms. And, and now we still get to a wedding day. So could you comment on that, please? The only comment I could make is, um, 
the song, for what I understand, the song is sung because it was, um, as, as I mentioned, there were there, there's, there's these um, uh, poets and musicians and um, entertainers went from wedding to wedding, and it's, and there's a lot of speculation that the the song of songs actually is is a compilation of these wedding poems. Um, it's it's interesting as you read through the uh, as you read through the Song of Songs, there's repetition in the second half of the uh, of the of the Song of Songs. A lot, a lot a lot of verses are repeated, so it almost sounds like you know some some somebody wrote wrote a lyrics if you like to a, uh, to a song, and then somebody centuries later maybe rewrote it or it was it was it was it was, it was, it was uh, passed down you know verbally, and it ended up different. So there's a kind of subtle differences in some of the verses. Um, so being that, being, have, having that said, I think the whole, the reference to the Solomon and, and his marriage, um, it was just, I think it's just one of the poems that ended up in this compilation. And other than that, I can't explain it. There are other, there are other um, uh, um, verses in the poem which are very, Difficult um, and scholars have had a lot of difficulty with, especially the one with the with um, the Shulamite being beaten by the watchman. Nobody quite understands what that one was about. Um, but you know, I but I selected obviously as, as a visual artist, I selected um, uh, verses that, that that meant something to me and that I could interpret visually. Um, so it's a lot of sometimes you go through poems and it's like I can't really. I can't really uh, express that one uh, visually. Um, some are very, so some are very dramatic. Uh, the the crowning is a dramatic image, and the 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 uh, Shulamite being beaten by Watchmen is also a very dramatic image. Um, my understanding, my explanation of it is, it's like a warning in the, in the middle of all this, all these poem, all these verses about love and unity. Uh, all of a sudden, she's getting beaten by these by these soldiers or watchmen, and it's like, you know, a shock back to reality. Okay, know? we need to leave it there. Um, we have time after the next uh, session to ask Alan or the next presenter more questions. But for now, we're moving on to Kohenet Becca Starr. She's from Beacon, New York. She's a sacred artist exploring connections between Jewish mysticism and the divine feminine. She's a witness to the sacredness of all that is life, source, and creation. Becca is an ordained Kohenet, Hebrew priestess, offering spiritual support through inspirational artwork and embodied ritual. Her website is Becca Star, with two R's, art.com. Becca, it's all yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your presence. Um, here, I know there's a lot of offerings, and I appreciate that you're spending time your time here. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, I think I'm not a co-host right now, Yona, and so I can't uh, share my screen. Hold on, I thought I made you a co-host, but let me double check. Okay. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. That's okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Is how's that? Is that working now? Oh yeah. Okay, great. But that's the wrong slide. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There we go. Okay, so um, I am offering this presentation with gratitude to the Jewish Art Salon, to Jada, to Art Kibbutz, um, to Alan Falk. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be part of this. Um, I also want to offer gratitude to all my teachers and to the Kohenet community who are my inspiration for all of my work. Um, 
When I'm creating art, I often sing prayers of liberation and devotion as part of my practice. Um, to begin this session, I'd like to share a song. This is a song for healing. There's, as Yona mentioned earlier, quite a bit of pain and anger and heartbreak in the world happening right now and um, in solidarity with people of color. I'd like to offer this song for healing and I welcome you to type names into the chat box if that is a practice that you'd like to do to include people in this song for healing. And this is a song that maybe some of you might be familiar with. Um, it's a simple prayer that um, I'll be singing in the feminine. Anna Ilana, Anna Ilana, Anna Ilana, Rafina La, Anna Ilana, Anna Ilana. Anna Hilana Rafina. So in order to frame who I am as an artist, I'd like to introduce you to the Kohenet movement. This is a picture of me receiving smicha from my teachers. Um, last summer. Smicha is a teacher's blessing. This is also the what is known as the ordination moment in the Kohenet community. So what is a Kohenet? A Kohenet is a person who has studied with and received Smicha, the teacher's blessing from the uh, Kohenet Hebrew Priestess Institute. We are Jewish clergy who exist at the place where Judaism, earth-based spirituality, and feminist practices meet. The modern concept of a Kohenet is based on ancient practices of Jewish women. We pray in the feminine. You'll hear Kohanot praying using feminine God language and using different names of goddess. For example, we say Brucha at Shechina rather than the more well known Baruch Ata Adonai. Kohanot share their multitude of gifts in many ways. Every Kohanot expresses their priestessing in a different way. Um, ritual making, leading communities, social justice works, and of course, creating art. We use ritual as a means for transformation. So firstly, I am a priestess and I express my priestessing through my art. Prayer is a ritual for me. I create ritual also as my art making practice and art is my prayer. There are many layers in my work. Each layer has a different meaning and a different interpretation. If you're familiar with the Pardes acronym, you might be able to see that at play in my work. Basically, there are very literal representations in my work and also underlying, less noticeable, intentional transformation happening in each piece. I'll try my best to discuss this as we move through this talk. In my art making, I aim to work towards collective liberation, focusing mostly on women's empowerment. Art making is my spiritual practice and my spiritual practice journal. The first piece I'd like to share with you is called The Weaver. It is a part of a series called Hamsas for the Divine Feminine, which is a series inspired by the Kohenet Institute. Each illustration is one of many pathways that offer us deeper connection with different aspects of the Divine Feminine. I'm highlighting this piece from the series because I think it illustrates the method I use to activate and complete my work. Letters are the building blocks of thoughts. Thoughts create intention, and intention creates action. These are teachings from the book Sefer Yetzirah, which is the Jewish mystical book of creation, written sometime 
between the 4th and 12th century or 13th century, I think. Nobody knows exactly when. Um, when we use letters to form words and then speak them into the universe, we can create transformation. We're doing magic. The patriarchy dismisses magic, but that's what we're doing. Not just in my art, but in ancient Jewish mystical practices. I know a piece of work is completed when I have a piece of liturgy or a prayer from the Kohenet Sidur or some other words that come to me. Once those words come to me, I use the letters of that liturgy or that prayer to activate and complete the painting. All of my paintings and my, all of my other mixed media work are a ritual process of activating spiritual transformation. I'll now share with you what I'm currently calling the Divine Energy Series. It is a series that has become about trying to understand and capture divine energy. It is a series that is still in process and some pieces are complete and some are not. I'll be sharing the completed ones and if we have time, I, you can probably see some of them behind me, the ones that are not yet complete. Um, this series has already been selected to be shown at the end of the year for a four month solo show in Beacon, New York, um, on Wappingers, Native Wappingers land where I live. And was also supposed to be shown this past month of May um, as well, and hopefully that will be rescheduled at some point. And I'm also apologizing in advance for the Hebrew text here. Um, my computer did not love the copying and pasting of Hebrew text. So I'll begin talking about these pieces in the order that they were created. This first piece was created in honor of my smicha last summer from the Kohenet Institute. The first piece in the Divine Energy series started with the image of Shekhinah's wings that I received in a meditation. The second layer is the colors of black and white and gold, which you'll see repeated through the series. These colors really carry the series together and they represent for me the concept of divine energy. The third layer you'll notice in this piece is this kind of ghosted image of a form in between the wings and that is done in Conti crayon. The form is purposely androgynous. The final layer of this piece is the extension of the wings, which are done in many strips of different fabrics and lace. And the song that activated this piece was written by Kohenet Joe Kent Katz. And the words of the, of the song are, Shechina spreads her wings and we come home to receive her love. The second piece in this series began with the background of divine energy with the same gold, white, and black that you'll notice throughout the series. The second layer is this figure, and the figure is purposely left as an outline to allow the energy of the divine represented by the background colors to come through the form. The last layer of this piece was the prayer Anu Matanu which comes from the Kohenet Sidor and is written on the side of the screen. Translated, we have found rest beneath Shekhinah's wings. And those, were, were, those words were written on vellum and then attached to the form as translucent wings. The next piece is similar to the last one in that it is an expression of the divine energy through a pregnant figure. Again, in the same style as just the outline to allow the background colors to come through the form representing this divine energy. The prayer that came through is one that we sing in the Kohenic community. Four of the common ways that we refer to the divine primordial sacred feminine. Shekhinah El Shaddai, Ima Ila'a, Tsimtsimai. This piece was activated in the same way with the with these names of the goddess written on the wings. This next piece is about healing from sexual trauma. The first layer is the background layer of the gold and white and black of the divine energy. The second layer in black Conti crayon is the initials of some of my abusers written on the canvas. And then another layer of the colors of divine energy over those initials. The final piece is a golden vulva that is whole and healed. 
the prayer that is associated with this piece is the one I sang in the beginning to open this portal of sharing my artwork, Ana Elana Refinala, which is a prayer for healing. This last piece was inspired by my studies with the artist Beit Midrash that the Jewish Art Salon sponsored in collaboration with the Strix Sixth Street Synagogue over the winter where we studied the story of the four who entered Pardes from early Talmudic writings. Again, this piece is represented with gold and white and black of divine energy. The marks that you see at the bottom, the circles and lines are the words patriarchy taken apart. There is a magical practice of using the lines and strokes of the forms of letters to create sigils. Sigils are a way of using these concepts that I discussed earlier when I spoke about the book Sefer Yetzirah, though I don't believe that the word sigil is um, in a Jewish context. It's a new practice that I've learned about recently and I haven't had the fullness of time to study it. Um, but basically sigils are used to form new words or new symbols and intention. Usually this is a practice of taking letters apart to their basic structure of lines and curves and then reforming them into a new design to create a symbol of intention that you're trying to achieve. Since my work is much about empowering women, I chose to take apart the word patriarchy and leave the forms of the letters dismantled, thereby activating the, atten the intention of dismantling patriarchy. Um, and now I'll stop sharing my screen and I will share with you my studio um, and a few of the pieces that are in progress still behind me. This piece is um, so far about resilience and it's not quite yet complete. I'm not sure where exactly it's going. And then I have um, another piece down here. This is the first piece that I've used any color in, and I'm not still quite sure how I feel about that, but it's what the piece was calling for, so um, so that's where it is right now. Um, and then I have one more piece here, which is, for me, very much about chaos right now. Um, there are pieces you can maybe see a little bit that have been burned through the canvas, um, I set fires on the canvas when I was in a mode of expressing a lot of anger and chaos. Um, and I will end my pre presentation and invite your questions um, with this quote that was sent to me by Kohenet Ray Abelea this morning to remind me and all of us that the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. And this was written um, this was said by Tony Cade Bambara. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, both you, Becca, and you, Alan. We're now, I'm going to see who raised their hand to have a question for... Okay, Rina from Israel. Oh, you actually have spoken up a lot, but all right. <laughs> Go ahead, ask a question. Oh, I have to unmute people, sorry. Uh, or, or actually, if you can unmute yourself, I'm gonna unmute Rina right now. And she won't let me do it. Okay, so we're moving on to another. I am unmuted. I have not spoken up today and I didn't speak up last week either. So I haven't spoken up a lot, sorry. <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I was looking for people who haven't spoken at all, but it's totally fine. We so enjoy hearing from you because you always have like very interesting opinions. This is, by the way, this presentation is right up your alley, Rina. And we also really appreciate that you're tuning in from Israel. So take the floor. Yeah. Hello from Jerusalem. Uh, thank you so much. This was such a resonant uh, um presentation to me. I found it to be extremely evocative and very resonant. And I was just wondering, there were two pieces, the patriarchy piece and also the Anaya Narifanala. Both of them, I saw figures and faces in them. And I wonder if you see them as well, or I mean, you didn't mention them. So I'm assuming they were not put there 
consciously, but I'm wondering whether you see them. I found it, them tremendously evocative, and thank you so much. And thank you, Alan, as well. But this one spoke to me in, in ways that I needed to say. That's it. Thank you, Rena. I appreciate hearing that so much. It's um, always so nice to hear others with um, resonating with my work. Um, the figures are not intentional, no, and I'm sure um, any artist would tell you that you, you, you know, when you're doing practices and, and uh, even just sketching, there's always figures that pop out. Um, at least that's my experience when I'm drawing um, specifically, like when I'm doing this abstract art, I use a palette knife. And um, so I think that there's the possibility to see whatever you see in the, in the pieces for sure. And I love that you see figures in them. That, that is so great. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rianne. No, I was gonna say we could like, we could, um, you know, those search and find uh, coloring pages that people do, we could, we could like circle where you see the figures. <laughs> um, I see two more people who are raising their hands, but uh, these were Nancy and Shoshana. Now, I don't know if this is that you're again raising your hand or it was like a holdover from Alan's. Uh, if you did indeed raise your hand, then Shoshana, please go ahead. Otherwise, uh, Nancy. Okay, I'm not hearing. Okay. Actually, Yona, I didn't raise my hand, but I would certainly like to say thank you to, to Becca for something that, uh, for a presentation that included many things that I didn't know anything about. So uh, that's all, but I, no, I didn't raise my hand actually. Uh, oh, okay, it was a holdover from Alan's. Okay, yeah. no problem. Okay. All right, um, I'm looking, who else? Oh, Cynthia, please speak up. Okay, so since you mentioned that you're now using color, I'm interested because your pieces are not completely previously monochromatic. They have a certain color vocabulary. So how you came about using that and where you feel color might take you. You could just speak. Um, so I will say, it, first I will say, it's very weird that I don't use color in my work. People who know me are very surprised that my colors are all very, um, the series that I showed the illustrations is all black and white. This, the, the colors, the only color that is there is the gold. Um, and I think that for me, it's a way of, um, it's a different way that I express my inner world that I'm trying, I, I feel like there's a lot of chaos and a lot of, um, that's my daughter. Um, there's a lot of chaos in the world. As I say the word chaos, my daughter comes jumping in. Um, and I think that for me, the really like straight kind of one color palette make, offers me a level of comfort uh, at least at this point in my work. And that's why the, the red is very startling to me. It's very jarring. And also what's happening in the world is also very startling and jarring. This piece is from this past week that I finally added the red to it. So in somewhat in response to maybe what's going on in the world, I don't know if that exactly answers your question. Can I just quickly turn that around a little bit? In your, yeah, sure. your work or in other series, did you use color? Um, not much. I have one painting, which is, can you, uh, up there, it's very small. Um, I started to paint that in a rainbow and I just couldn't get to a place where I loved it. And I ended up covering it mostly with black. Um, I'll take, I'll take you over so you can see it a little bit better. Um, oh, okay. So that whole piece, you can see the, the red, yellow, and blue kind of peeking out. And that piece has a ton of layers because I ended up just needing to cover it. I worked it so, so much. I added um, vellum over it and there's many layers because I just couldn't get to a place where I liked it. So no, I don't use color in my work. <laughs> Short answer. I would just like to end by saying your use of texture and gesture is so wonderful and so expressive yeah. that you know you're you're doing it with yeah 
So, uh, I do love texture. In, in uh, some of my other mixed media work, I am a weaver. And so I, my weavings are very chaotic and have multiple dimensions as well. Um, they're all on my website if you want to go take a look at those. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I have a question. Um, when I first met you, um, Becca, you, went, you introduced yourself as, you know, a Kohenet, uh, a Hebrew priestess. I said, hey, I know someone else who identifies as that. And actually, this person is here on the line today, although I'm pretty sure it's a different type of priestessness than you're uh, referring to. But Cheslin, I was wondering, you once mentioned something similar. Would you like to maybe explain how you identify? I'd just like to hear the difference because this is such a totally new concept for me. Oh gosh, and I don't even recall us necessarily speaking to that, but you know what? I, I, I've worked really closely with Taya, sure, and with Kohenet because uh, I, I actually live here in the Bay Area and I added to my toolkit recently a Master's of Theological Studies because I'm now a kind of an interfaith chaplain, spiritual care provider and bereavement specialist. Um, so really, I just, so I'm not sure about the, the, what you might be referring to there, Yona, but the uh, Kohenet Institute and the folks, just so wonderful. And um, I encourage Thank everyone you. to engage and learn more. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. And Taya um, is one of the co-founders of the Kohenet Institute, who you were mentioning that you study yeah. with, along with um, Rabbi uh, and Rob Kohenet Jill Hammer. Jill Hammer, yes. Yeah. Great. Um, there is a question by Robin and John. It's really Robin. Um, hey, Robin. Oh, Robin. That's Robin. Hi, Robin. <laughs> Thank you. That was amazing. Thanks, Robin. Is in your weavings, do you use color? Um, very muted, and uh, each color palette of each weaving is um, fairly monochromatic. Like I will use various varying shades and mostly reds and purples, um, but not too too much. A lot of neutrals. Yeah, but in my weavings, yes, a little bit more. Um, and the other question is, what is, how long have you been doing art? And what is the direct connection to the spiritual practice of the Cohen, um, being a Cohenet? Um, so way before. So I think that, and I, I think that for most clergy people, they would say that they've known for probably their whole life and then, you know, the calling and all of that kind of thing. Um, so I've been, I think, creating ritual and doing priestessing work for my whole life. Uh, similar with art, I've always been very attracted to, um, to, creativity in general. It took me a long time to feel confident in my work as an art and in, as my work as an artist and to finally claim myself as an artist. Um, the first, I think the first art show that I was in that wasn't, you know, like school sponsored or something like that was in Brooklyn probably 12 years ago or so. Um, but you know, in college, I I don't I didn't have the courage to to just claim myself as an artist, and I kind of went around it and took all of my elective classes at, in the art building and things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that is probably the answer to part of your question. And then the other part of the question about um, art and spirituality is that what you're asking? Um, yeah. I think. I don't remember. I think that art is a really important practice in spirituality, and I could probably talk about this for a long time. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on art and spirituality. Um, I think 
the, the thing I will say is that specifically for people who are visual learners or who are not, you know, who don't ingest information through auditory or through written text, the visual gives us a, a way to experience that. Um, and, you know, offers another layer that we can use to, um, to explore our spirituality. Bless right. Love you. We'll talk. Thanks, Robin. Okay, Becca, we have time for one more question specifically for you, but there are several people who raised their hands, so we can continue that after the last question, but then knowing that it's a free for all, people can also ask questions for Alan. So the last person, officially for you right now, is <laughs> Ezra Rose. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. I okay. Um, hi, Becca. Um, I just wanted to say thank you um, for bringing everything that you brought to this presentation. Um, I was so excited to see um, someone working with the mystic elements, um, working with, you know, kind of the traditions of, of you know, Jewish mysticism. Um, I'm also someone who works with art as a spiritual practice. Um, and particularly, I was excited about your sigil painting, um, since sigils are a really big part of my work um, and my practice. And I, I was excited to see the kind of like, what looked to me maybe like early stages of, of you know, you're, de you're deconstructing some elements, but I was curious to know if you're interested in um, constructing and making sigils, because um, I could see them integrating really beautifully with um, the textures and the colors that you're working with in your paintings. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is something that I'm really interested in and I'm studying with a few different teachers and, and learning about sigil making more right now. The, um, the piece that is behind me um, right there, that one, that's about resilience. Um, I, ha I am sketching some ideas about what a sigil for resilience could look like. And um, I have, you know what, I'm going to show you all quickly just these, these are different sketches. So this, I just want to show people my process because I don't know if everybody knows what sigils are. So basically you take a word here. This is the way that I'm doing it right now. You take a word and then you kind of like break apart all the um, pieces of it and then you put it back together in a different way. So these are some of the sketches that I've been working with and that I'm working on right now. And you can kind of see my process of like, how I'm putting together the different elements of it. Um, so that's one thing that I'm working on right now. And I, I, I also want to say that I think creating art in this pandemic is very different for me than I've ever done before. You know, normally I have like large amounts of time where my husband and my kids are out of the house and I can be in my studio quietly. And that's not been happening. So I, I have to find other ways of making art and sigils is one that's speaking to me right now. And so I don't know if that will carry through like after, you know, shutdown lifts and all of those kinds of things where my art will go, but this is what I'm doing right now, at least. Great. Thank you so much. We are now opening the floor to questions for both Becca and Alan. And the next one in line was Fred Spinovic. Hi, thank you very much to both. Beck, uh, can you have an example of the weaving that you can bring? Fred, you're, you're, you're breaking up quite a bit. You want to try again? Sorry about that. I like to see some of the weaving you have. I don't think, uh, yeah, maybe if you can type in the chat box your question. I'll try. Okay. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay. Does anyone else have a question while we're waiting for Fred to type in his message? A question for either Alan or Becca. I know, Joel, you earlier raised your hand during Alan. Did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, oh, sure. It's for Becca specifically, although I see a lot of connections between both of your works in terms of the divine feminine and female empowerment. I thought that was really powerful, both presentations. Um, the main thing, I'm really interested, Becca, in how you've worked art and ritual together, because I did something over the Omer period with my own work, creating small 
fiber pieces that I would sew and paint each day of the Omar. Um, so I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more of your process for that and how you develop the two intertwined. Awesome. Um, yes. And before I answer the question, I'm just going to highlight another artist who's, who did a similar fiber um, arts Omer piece, um, Lois Gaylord, who's an incredible fiber artist that it would be great to, if you could connect, because I'm sure you're doing similar work. Um, so my art practice um, as a ritual is, uh, so my studio, which is where I'm sitting right now, the part that I didn't show you is, this is my altar, and I have all of my uh, books and all of my elements of, um, of ritual working. So I have, you know, my say in my uh, cedar bundle that I use to clear the air before I start practice. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, I am usually chanting or praying or singing some sort of songs. Um, as a priestess, I do this a lot in my life in general, but specifically while I'm making art, I am always singing and praying and trying to figure out how to create transformation through the work. Um, specific rituals that I do are lighting a candle before I work. That's like the one thing that I really try to always remember to do is, um, and that kind of helps me to create a sacred container and a moment of a deep breath or something before I enter into um, partnership with Shekhinah where I'm, I'm, asking for guidance and, and feeling the creative flow happening. Was that the, was that the answer? I yeah, think the answer that, I'm noticing I'm looking over at my little studio table and my powder coat and I light and let's yeah. say, like, yeah, something kind of similar happening in my studio too, when I also don't have children at home all the time, so. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, I just want to mention, because I think there's probably people on the call that are from many different um, experiences within Judaism, and I just want to mention about altar practice just quickly, and just note that um, many people have objection to this, and that is fine, and you can have your thoughts about altar practice. For me, it's an ancient traditional practice, and that's part of my work as a Kohenet and reclaiming ancient uh, practices. And if you're interested, I'd be more than happy to have conversation off this call uh, about that deeper, if it's something that you're wanting to discuss. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Judith Joseph has a question. Hello, everyone. I first want to say that I really enjoyed both presentations. They, they are very different and it gave me, a, I took a lot of notes. So thank you both. I had a question for Alan. Um, I, I'm so um, moved by your work and very, very impressed by your composition, which is really complex and the way you fit all the, the characters in uh, um, the frame, it's, it's very dynamic. In some cases, I saw some art historical references, perhaps, like some of them, one, a few of them reminded me of William Blake. So, Alan, can you speak to your stylistic influences and how you make choices about just the way you present the stories that you present? Okay, so I don't know what's happening with Alan. Let me see if he's behind the screen. Maybe he walked off for a second. No, he's there. Oh, he's unmute. He's muted. I'm sorry. Unmute. Alan, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Uh, did you hear J Judith Joseph's question? Yes. Okay. Uh, I was like, uh, William Blake was a, an important influence of mine. A uh, very interesting influence of mine because uh, A, I grew up in, in England and B, uh, high school I went to, uh, there was a uh, Whitworth, Whitworth Art Museum at the top of the street in my where my high school was, and I had a lot of William Blake's there, um, and Turner's. Um, the other interesting thing about William Blake was um, my my first mentor uh, was my was a head of painting at the art school I went to, which was Ma Manchester College of Art, and the head of painting was was uh, Norman Adams. Norman Adams went on later to become the um, 
the keeper of the Royal Academy schools in London. Um, he actually thought his his work was in, he was a uh, very much influenced by Ad, uh, by Blake as well um, to the point that he thought he was a reincarnation of Adam Blake of, of William Blake. Um, actually, looked looked a lot like his image Im the images of William Blake. But, um, a very a very extremely powerful painter um, and a great teacher. Um, uh, so, I mean, over, this, over the years, I've gone through lots of influences, um, and um, then I've spent a lot of years trying to shed all those influences. Um, so the, the, work is, the work is constructed, I've, I've constructed in, um, takes me a long time to, to uh, put together a composition. I work and rework uh, ideas. Sometimes they'll, they will, um, they'll be in the back burner for, for maybe two, three years um, as I uh, think and rethink um, uh, uh, a subject and a composition. Um, and the very, they are deliberately complicated in the sense of uh, many layers. I'm an artist who believes in, um, in communicating uh, through a multitude of different uh, aesthetic uh, elements in a, in a work of art from the, the concept to the form to uh, the color to the composition particularly form the, my other mentor uh, was uh, Will Barnett and um, the last thing he said to me I visited him just a couple, few months before he died at the grand old age of 101 um, he, he looked at some of my work that I brought him and he just said form. Three minutes, that's it. Everything is form. And so um, I hope that answers your question in some way. Yeah. It did, and I, I forgot to mention that I thought the Devic series was spectacular. It's so moving, and um, it, <laughs> I love it. I kind of want to look into that for myself. So yeah, thank you. Fascinating. Uh, both, both are so deep uh, and fascinating in terms of. Uh, uh, depth of depth of uh, you can you can just keep finding out more and more, which I which I've been doing. I'm still finding out more about the Divock and more about um, the Song of Songs after a, a lot of research. Thank you. Okay, Pearl had a question. Pearl, I tried to unmute you, but I guess you'll have to do it yourself because I wasn't okay. successful. Thank you. No, I didn't have a question. I enjoyed the. Uh, presentation. I also typed in from one shaman to another. Really appreciate what did you talk about, you know, breaking down the use of, of words and uh, altruism. And I always tell people, uh, nothing's new under the sun. Everything that they talk about in the new age was written in the Bible. Incense, zektoret, stones, crystals, the breastplate on the, on the Kohen, um, meditation. So yeah, nothing's new under the sun. So, so thank you. I did not find the hand. Yeah, that's, I got a message from Cynthia saying you tried to raise your hand. That's why I was calling on uh, you right now, but, um, okay. Um, all right. Is there any other question right now? There is no one else who raised their hand. Is there anybody else? I guess not. So, this session is concluded. Thank you both for like really interesting presentations. Like I mentioned last week, you both actually took off where you know last pre last week's presentation you know ended. Um, uh, you back out because you were working with the Shekhina and Alan because he was uh, inspired by works by S. Ensky. So I just love these like spontaneous like. Uh, things happening where there are connections between sessions uh, that you can't anticipate beforehand. So thank you both. Um, next week we have three different presenters. We have Alan Holtzblatt from Chicago who will present her paintings and we have two fiber artists, uh, Ruth Simon McRae and Lori Wall who will uh, present um, their fiber art. And uh, I will send out an email about that this Wednesday. So thank you all for joining. Wishing you all a very good week. And speak to you soon. Bye-bye.
Thank you so much, Fiona. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Shona. Oh, Becca and Ellen, a lot of people left uh, really nice comments in the chat, so I will export that to you and email it to you so you can read them in case you didn't have a chance to read it right now. Thank Ellen, you. can you please put that link in the chat room? Yeah, uh, I did. Oh, you did? Oh, I didn't see it. Okay. All right. Um, uh, I guess I'll find it later. Okay. Yona, I have a request. Yeah, sure. If possible. Okay, so... Uh, I'm out here in California now after living in Israel for 45 years, uh, watching the news and uh, the unrest, and I uh, think it's connected to the talk that we had today, that instead of focusing on the negativity, I think it's a time for prayer. So if you are watching the news, try to send up prayers. Now, I met Dorothy, who uh, started Finhorn in Scotland. And she had mentioned to, to us that there is an angel that watches over every city. So last night or this morning, I just talked to the angels of all the cities and asked her to open up and pray and just try, if you can, to send up positivity to the situation. I think that would help instead of you know, us focusing on all the pain that is happening now. That I think is a very good suggestion, Pearl, uh, and something that we very much need. Let's all focus on the positive and pray for a healing uh, of this situation. You know, that's where, as a religious person, I would say that's where it all starts. You know, we praying, and that will bring it down back to earth. But it's going to take a lot of work on our side because <laughs> the situation is not so good. But thank you for bringing that up. Really good point. We're strong. We can do it. So who said that? I couldn't. See. I did. Oh, there, Pearl. <laughs> yes. We're strong human beings, and we can do it. You never know. Uh, okay, you as a soul, you don't know what your background is. You may not know how powerful you are. So I'm saying that we are all powerful human beings, and if you unite in this positivity, we have the opportunity to make changes. We can do it. You know. Yeah. Try to lessen the pain that's happening. Very good. Well, on that note, I'm going to bid you adieu. Thank you all for joining. And um, see you next week, hopefully. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you, Yona. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Alan.